All right, guys. Well, let's go ahead and get started. We'll jump straight into our Wednesday webinar. Uh, webinar. Um, and uh, we're going to jump into things. I just want to make one very quick announcement. It probably hasn't affected you guys that are um, already members with me, but just it's come to my attention. I've been getting, uh, it's, it happened last week, and then uh, there's just like a ton of accounts starting to pop up. I don't know if it's one person or a full team going savage mode or anything like that, but uh, there's a bunch of impersonators on, as far as I've seen so far, Instagram and Telegram. Um, people are making like fake accounts of me and using all my photos uh, from my main Instagram and people are messaging people on Telegram to like send them, you know, thousands of dollars and they're promising returns of like, you know, like just, it just unrealistic stuff. You guys know how it goes. So uh, just a, a warning out there that that's happening. So like I said, it's probably not affecting you guys, but if you have like friends or anybody that, you know, have been following me, uh, let them know, just kind of put the word out there so that nobody, um, falls victim to one of these people. Um, and just make sure if you guys are ever talking to me, um, just make sure that you check the username. You can click on my profile in Telegram if you ever DM me or want to DM me and you can see it just as my first and my last name. That's it. No variations, no before or afters, no words or letters before or after. I think uh, the person that's impersonating me on Instagram right now, they're using like I am David Schinkel as you know, and that's definitely not me. It's just my first and my last name. So yeah, guys, just, just careful out there. I want to make that very, very brief, uh, but James, uh, Jameson, it's, I think it's just been going on for a couple weeks now. I've been getting, I got like one message about it. I got the account taken down and removed, but then there's like a lot more popping up just today. So I don't know. They're trying to go, trying to go hard and I don't really, really know the deal. So, uh, that's just a little, little, uh, update life update, but, uh, or I guess a little side update, but let's go ahead and get into our Wednesday webinar. Um, Let's look at the economic calendar. Oh, first, yeah, on the economic calendar today, there wasn't a lot that happened. Um, we did see a little pep in the U.S. dollar today. I think that it's just a little bit of a reaction to, um, you know, I mean, I don't think that this PMI is the main main reason, but um, yeah, we're gonna look at the U.S. dollar in just a moment. But keep in mind, guys, uh, the big day I guess is still to come. I call it the big day because Friday is non-farm payrolls. That's gonna be a you know, and any time is non-farm payrolls. That's a very significant event. But tomorrow, over the next 24 hours before we meet, we're gonna have a couple red folders. We're gonna see a couple um, central bank speakers. We're gonna see Governor Kuroda from the Bank of Japan. We're gonna see Governor Carney from the Bank of England. Um, we're going to see a monetary policy statement released from Europe, and we're going to also see a press conference from the ECB following that policy statement. So this is actually pretty important to focus on um, as far as uh, gaining a sentiment on the euro. And then in between there at the same time is also a trade balance for the Canadian dollar. So that's going to be it for the next 24 hours. Um, so I want to go over the charts. I want to look at euro USD very quickly. And um, I want to just kind of dissect what's taken place since we last met 24 hours ago. So just to give you guys a little bit of a time, um, a timeline, let's go back to yesterday's, where were we? It would be June 4th and seven o'clock is 1900 for me. I, for it's seven o'clock. So we were right here. So let me just circle it. So 24 hours ago, we were about right here, and I kind of went into this spiel um, about me being bear. Well, I, I start, it started on Monday. I just reiterated it yesterday about being bearish, taking a bearish stance now on the dollar index and taking a bullish stance on Euro USD. And I said that I think that that's gonna, this is going to last for you know, this is just a rough estimate. Like I'm not the market maker guys. I, I don't know exactly, but this is just a rough time frame. I think between the next two weeks to eight weeks. So next half a month to two months, we're going to begin to see this downtrend that Euro USD has been in for um, almost two years now unravel and correct higher. And I think that that is going to be, um, you know, of course reciprocated in the dollar index falling as well. Now I want to be very clear guys that uh, what's happening today uh, does not does not change my bias at all. Okay, I know some of you guys uh, are definitely looking at the daily chart on Euro USD, which is okay to do. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about everything, 
And I'm sure a lot of you guys see like a bounce off of 1300 again, where we retested this major level. If you guys aren't familiar with 1300, I'm not going to go into a big spiel, but I would just recommend at least putting a horizontal line um, at 113 and just keeping it there um, as like a kind of a permanent level. This level, not to get like too much into it, but basically this level became relevant in October of last year as a pretty significant level of support. And we've seen it act as different levels of support and resistance um, over the past couple months. And I think you guys can just very quickly see that visual. So I guess that was the spiel. But um, so I mentioned, if you guys read my Telegram post that I posted a few hours ago, I said that this is clearly showing some sellers stepping into the market, right? We get pretty much a textbook bearish engulfing candle, um, nice exhaustion candle. But what I want you guys to keep in mind, okay, if you guys are familiar or maybe you enjoy, you like to trade bearish engulfing candles, they have a much higher probability of working on higher time, or I'm sorry, at extreme levels, all right? And what I mean is at extreme highs and extreme lows. Meaning that if you see a bearish engulfing candle, which we see here, at an extreme high, it has a lot better chance of working out or the price action being respected um, than it does if it's at, uh, you know, in the middle of a range or even at some lows. And then vice versa for bullish engulfing candles. It's going to work out, uh, you're going to have a higher success rate of trading just simply off of a bullish engulfing candle if you're doing it at extreme lows versus again in the middle of the range or even maybe trading at the top of you know at, at extreme highs. So when I look at Euro USD, I do recognize that it's got this bearish engulfing candle, but we have to keep in mind that we're pretty low on Euro USD. Um, now this doesn't mean that we can't get some short-term sells. I think if I even actually read the last sentence, I posted this like five hours ago in Telegram. If you are curious or didn't get a chance to see it, go read the message. But I said in parentheses, last sentence, I said, this means if you're a scalper, you can look for very short-term sells towards my buy target. And I said, my buy target would be, I, I'm going to observe price action as we get down to 112. Um, and then maybe even a little bit lower towards like 111.70. Um, I did see my alert got hit, so I'm actually going to delete that now. Now, the reason why I'm not entering right here at my alert is because of the price action that's been created on the one day. And what I think, and again, this is just opinion. You know, I could be completely wrong, guys. I always want you to remember that, all right? This is just one man's opinion in the market. I'll bite. I, you know, I'm, I'm a professional trader and a successful, profitable trader. Um, I still have my losses and I obviously I'm not perfect. I have my times I'm wrong also. So um, keep in mind, this is just my opinion. But I think that this is primarily being um, used as a bear trap by market makers right now. Um, you know, a lot of retail traders, they're going to, you know, base a lot of their trades just based off of simple price action, which again, I want to, I want to reiterate that trading off of simple price action and keeping it simple. Or if you guys have ever heard the um, acronym KISS, keep it stupid simple or keep it super simple, whatever you want to say, that does work. But again, remember the important details of um, bullish and bearish engulfing candles that they have a higher success rate at their respective extremes. Okay. And remember, if we look at your USD, it's not at the extreme highs right now. It's actually at extreme lows. So, you know, selling so low on a bearish engulfing candle at extreme lows, when we're already seeing weakness come in for the US dollar, keep in mind, we've, we've made multi-week lows on the dollar index. It's finally starting to show some weakness. Um, in my opinion, I think that Euro USD, this is just creating a bear trap. I think what it's trying to do is I think it's trying to trap a lot of traders into taking cells. Um, and just to kind of add to my uh, idea, so um, I don't, I'm not in like a lot of groups. I've, I literally, I'm in zero Telegram groups uh, besides mine and uh, Louis. I don't have any other, I don't have a single group that I look at. Um, I would show, open my Telegram and prove it to you guys, but I, it also unfortunately shows like the preview of messages. So I don't want to be disclosing all my private messages and stuff. But, um, but I am, um, I was invited last year to um, just kind of like here and there, basically moderate a, um, a Facebook group with like 25,000 people in it related to Forex. And all I see people talking about Euro USD right now, probably about 90% of the traders 
are talking about selling Euro USD right now. They're all saying take super long sells, you know, aim for 1.07 or whatever, this and that. Um, but in my opinion, I, you know, like I always say, observe the masses and do the opposite. And, uh, you know, obviously you need to have like reasoning behind that. There's a lot more than, you know, I'm not just taking a buy on Euro USD because everybody on social media is saying to sell. Like there's, there's obviously I've explained in detail on past webinars of why I'm looking at buying Euro USD right now. But, um, yeah, that's, that's what I think is happening. I think a bear trap is going to be created. I really think that this downside is limited. So I do think there will be a little bit of downside probably over the next 12 hours throughout the London and the New York session. But I think that that's, it's going to be very limited downside. Um, and again, I think that this is just a bear trap for people to get in now. And then, you know, maybe, maybe they'll get into a little bit of profit. I think that's what the market makers will want, you know, to, you know, that's how they'll manipulate people. They'll, you know, maybe even make an, today's daily candle, like a big red bearish candle to really FOMO people, that fear of missing out and even shorting again down here, maybe increasing your position size or at doubling down or whatever. And then I believe that we're going to see Euro USD begin a breakout to the upside. And that's, again, I cannot stress enough that that's my opinion. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it. So when I draw this arrow right here, you know, I don't want you guys to like look at this on the one hour and see, well, it's doing the exact opposite. It's because I'm not, this arrow isn't meant to, um, you know, uh, paint a picture of what I think is going to happen on the one hour. This is more based on like the daily and the weekly moving up higher. So even if we were to do something like this and maybe even we consolidate down here for like the rest of the week or something, and then maybe we don't even see some momentum for the next week or two. Um, that still validates my bias. And let me let me be very clear uh, as far as invalidation. If you guys want to write down in your notes, or I, I recommend a whiteboard because it's you know we aren't, we aren't always going to be looking at this setup for forever, and there's really no need to waste paper. Um, get yourself. I recommend, by the way, just get yourself like a ton of whiteboards. They're super cheap. You can get them for like ten bucks. You can have as many. You don't have to hang them. I literally have one on my wall, and I have three that I just like keep sitting against the wall because I just, I have so much whiteboard and I know I don't want my, I'd rather have like paintings and pictures on the wall, not, not whiteboards. But um, anyways, if you want to write this down, my invalidation for a buy setup on Euro USD is simply this breaking the yearly lows right now. Okay. So if we break this low, which was from, what is that? May, it looks like May 24th or something like that. May 23rd right here. Okay, if we break the lows of this area, that's going to invalidate this trade for now. Okay, but um, yeah, I mean, and, and maybe to offer a perspective to you guys, I did I did this yesterday. I mean, I talked about the the long term time frame, but if you just kind of remove everything that's happened, and you take the lows of twenty sixteen. Well, also the lows, it's simultaneously the lows of 2016. Oh, that's so annoying. I wish you could just do like one tool without all the other tools popping up. But um, so you're going to kind of have to ignore everything besides this fib. Um, and if we retrace it, so when you're drawing a fib, you always draw left to right. Okay. So if you're trying to, um, you know, fib out from here to down here, you know, you're never going to draw, hopefully you guys can see my cursor for this, but you're never going to like take a fib and go from the right to the left. Okay. Think of like reading a book. I mean, unless you live in like Japan or something like that, where you read from right to left, most of us in most of the world, we, re we read from left to right. So think just naturally how you read a book. You don't go from right to left. And once you understand, like, I mean, Fibonacci is very basic, but once you understand, I mean, at least understanding it is very basic for the most part, or understanding the tool is very basic, but you'll understand it doesn't make any sense if you draw from right to left, because the 100% always has to be like at the bottom measuring what you're retracing. But um, so like same thing like this, if you were trying to let, let's say fib out this swing from like 2014 to 2016, you aren't going to go from right to left. You always need wherever your first, you know, you start the fib at, you always have to be going to the right. So you start here and you fib to the right. You know, if you're going to these lows or if you're going nuts to fib a downtrend, if you're trying to fib an uptrend, then you're obviously going to start at the bottom. And then you have to drag to the right, all right? Just a very, 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 very simple fib. I know a lot of you guys know, but maybe there's a couple of you guys that don't. Um, just something to note, we're at the 61.8% retracement level right now. Um, we're in between, uh, we're, we're a little bit lower than the 50% retracement level. Um, 
And it's just a significant level. The 61.8% retracement level is very significant in the market. And if we start to show a bounce in this area, um, I also actually want to look at this too. I want to look at, I want to show you guys these orders too. So we're going to have, all right. So keep in mind, guys, you need to, when, when I explain this right now, you have to think in the terms of hedge funds, people that take positions, okay? I know a lot of you guys, you know, might think that the whole Forex world is revolved around day trading, but I'm, I'm telling you right now, there's a, the largest part of Forex is revolved around position trading, okay? And position trading by technical definition is considered a step above swing trading. So it, it, it's position trading is usually working on an even larger target than a swing trade. All right. So these position trades, people have been long on Euro USD. Like you guys might not believe me, but trust me, like this is this is the world. It happens, all right. There have been people that have been long on Euro USD since 2017. They've literally been holding the position for two years. All right. There's people out there. I know it might not be the norm, but it is It is the norm when you get into uh, like the big world of managing. Like guys, you guys have to realize, let, let me just put this out there. Um, there are trillionaires in this world, okay? Just because when you go on the richest people in the world, it's probably Bezos right now. I think he has a, what, a worth of a little bit under 200 billion and he's the richest man in the world. That's documented, okay? That's 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 assets and stock uh, stock options and all that good stuff. But there are people that have trillion dollar net worths. Individual people, all right, not just families, have trillion dollar net worth. And there are hedge funds that manage not just a billion, but hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay, so I want you guys to to start if, if you haven't gone through this paradigm shift of understanding that the market is a giant and we are merely minnows in the ocean of whales literally you know like figuratively of course but uh that is how we are okay so you guys have to keep in mind we are the tiniest tiniest people on the food chain in the world of forex we are literally at the lowest of the pyramid Okay. So you have to keep it. You have to always think big. Okay. You always have to like open up that mind that this is, this is not a game. It's not just filled with a bunch of retail traders, just magically buying and selling. This is real. Okay. So there are people that have been long since 2017. All right. Now, as we, because this, if you were on yesterday's webinar, I talked about accumulation and distribution. All right. This is a very clear accumulation zone. All right. Now they're going to be, so people have been trade the markup. Now, obviously they've been, they've, there's literally people that have been holding it all through this drop, you know, expecting Euro USD to go higher. But basically if you can like imagine yourself just focusing on only these higher time frames, let's say you took a buy down here, right? And then a couple weeks go by, you see this bullish engulfing candle. You're like, okay, great. This trade's working out. You know, maybe you set your stop loss to break even however they manage their trades. Um, I'm sure they're pro they're obviously like hedge funds are hedging. So they're probably also maybe adding sells on the way up. Um, I don't want to get too advanced with you guys because that's, I mean, that's, that's what a hedge fund does. If you guys don't know, like hedge funds, it's, it's different than Martingale. Okay. Martingale is like doubling up on losing positions. Hedging is um, tech by definition, high risk because you're using a majority of the equity at, in the account. But anyways, that's for another time. Uh, just simply looking at like, just kind of like price action of how a trade might be managed. You have to keep in mind, let's actually push the chart back just a little bit. So, because this is, a, this is pretty relevant. Let me clear this and let me just re actually, I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. Okay. So now you have to think, okay, keep in mind that none of this matter of fact, none of that has happened. Matter of fact, let's do this. Let's go ahead and do replay and let's go right here. Okay. Let's say, uh, so here we are. You are now a hedge fund trader back in June of 2017. All right. You with your hundreds of billions of dollars that you manage, you know, you caught this whole short on Euro USD and you were hedging, you know, placing buys in here and you placed more buys down here. You have this major, this is literally guys, this right here is 
textbook accumulation, okay? If you guys don't understand uh, the, the Wyckoff method, I will go over it for you guys. If it's, I, well, it's obviously in the course, but if, if you guys want me to go over, like on, dedicate a whole lesson to it before then, I am more than happy to. But by definition, the Wyckoff method talks about a period of consolidation after a downtrend, you know, in, in, if we're talking about accumulation. And there is something that is pretty key in, in the Wyckoff method, at least, and it's called a spring, okay? And the spring is where you break, you know, if we're looking at accumulation where it's consolidating at lows, a spring is where, uh, or some people call it a breaker, whatever. Like, there's so many different, like, teachings and mythologies on this, methodologies on this that... Um, where it breaks the lows, right? And at this point, this is, you know, I've, I've explained what this does in many situations, right? It stops out all of the people that bought with very tight stop losses. And it also induces a wave of sellers because the lows have been broken, right? They, they, oh, some people might see, oh, Euro USD, it's consolidating sideways, making a giant bear flag, and it's just going to launch down right? But it's not as simple as that. You have to listen to what the market is doing. You have to understand when, the, when there's this spring here, and then you see this aftermath where it just goes back inside this range and consolidates. That's screaming long-term buys, okay? So again, back in 2000, June 2017, you bought Euro USD down in this area, all right? And now you are at a pivotal, extremely pivotal level of resistance, right? This has been multi-year resistance. 2015 couldn't break it. 2016 couldn't break it. Now here we are, middle of summer 2017, trying to break this level, all right? Now let's fast forward a little bit. Oops, let's uh, go through this. I don't want to click the wrong one. Forward, play, okay, forward. All right, so I'm going to kind of just click, oh, it doesn't do, oh, update one second. Okay, maybe let's see if I just play it. Okay, so I'm going to play it. All right, so let's go ahead and pause right here. All right, so let's say a couple weeks go by. You've been holding this buy since the bottom. Boom. You have finally, look at the high that we made in August. And then also, if you just want to look at this general resistance area, boom, we have officially broken it. You know, we're in, we're in very deep profit right now. Probably, you know, like if you're managing hundreds of billions of dollars and you're a hedge fund and you have a position on this, you, you might be literally like tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of profit right now. Um, and so you, you know, you, you manage this position, you're looking at price action, you're watching obviously the fundamentals, you're, you're look, you're taking everything in because obviously to be a hedge fund trader, you have to be well-rounded, right? You aren't just good with your fundamentals. You aren't just good with your technicals. You aren't just good with your sentimental analysis. You obviously are a well-rounded professional trader. You understand the ins and outs of everything, obviously, if you're managing that kind of money. Okay. So let's play this very quickly. And what you see is kind of like this consolidation start to happen. So you obviously are in this trade, and then you see this almost reaccumulation of price happening. And then you start to see it take off, right? You start to see it take off. So at this point, where would you logically, if you were a hedge fund manager and you're trying to secure your profits, where will you logically move your stop loss? Let me, let me ask you guys, you know, let me, let me hear it in the comments. If you, if you are long in this area, all right. And when price got up to these highs up here, you set your stop loss at break even. And now we're at this consolidation period and broke out. Where are you most likely going to set your stop loss at? Anybody let me know in the chat. Don't be, don't be like afraid to share guys. There's, there's like no, I mean, there's no wrong answer technically because you're, it's your own opinion. That's how you look at the market. I'm not going to shaft anybody for saying something that I'm not thinking. Uh, Marco, you says just below that consolidation. Andrew, you say 115. Jameson, you say 121. Chris, you say 116. Okay, cool. We got a lot of answers. And yeah, I mean, all of you guys are right. I personally would probably put my stop loss below these lows. So somewhere around, I think some of you guys said the 115, 116 area. Some of you guys said 120. That's totally fine. You know, if this, what I'm trying to uh, explain to you guys or paint this picture to you guys works in both scenarios, okay? So as you, as you move your stop loss up, right? So let's just kind of like fast forward. Let's, let's, get, let's get this up speeding up a little bit. Okay. So you see Euro USD continue to move up higher and higher and higher. All right. Let's let everything happen. 
hold on. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go real time so we don't we don't have to watch this. Okay. So what you see is from these highs, as price goes lower and lower and lower, it starts to take out these stop losses and stop people out. Now, one point that I'm trying to make is you don't, there's not, not everybody is going to put their stop loss. And, and this is why I said that all of you guys are right, because only a portion of the market is going to put their stop loss down here. There's another portion of the market that is going to put their stop loss just below this major consolidation. And there's also people that are going to put their stop loss up here. So there's different percentages of market participants that depending on their level of conservativeness or how they trade, they move their stop losses up, right? And then some people might even like have some crazy long-term target where their stop losses are just, you know, at break even from their, from their entry. Okay. So all of this, I'm just trying to explain to you guys that what I think one of the things that's happened over the past couple months as we've, or I guess technically year or so, year and a half or so, as Euro USD has gone lower, it's been an attempt. I mean, there's obviously fundamentals and there's a lot of things at play, okay? But you have to keep in mind there is manipulation in the market, okay? And that man manipulation will move price lower in an attempt to stop out, you know, a good deal of market participants that hold these long positions. So, um, I guess the reason I brought all this up is because before I segued into this is I talked about my invalidation being if it breaks the lows, okay? If Euro USD were to break the lows, which I don't think is going to happen, but if it were to break the lows, it's going to invalidate an immediate buy on Euro USD or an immediate idea of placing a buy on Euro USD, but it's not going to totally eliminate it from the future because Again, if you go back to this, let's say the, the, the weekly chart and you look at a level like this right here, we might just see, watch, let's like mark it off with uh, where a little bit below that area would be. That's like 11098. Let's just, let's just call it 111 let's, because it's, that's literally two pips away, right? 111. Okay. We may see price run just below 111, maybe even back down to this trend line area before bouncing. Okay. So there's a couple different scenarios that can play out on Euro USD. It's definitely, uh, uh, I'm trying to find the right word to use, but I, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, difficult to pick tops and bottoms when you're working on such high time frames. But if you are able to pick a top or a bottom, now I'm not saying every single, you know, obviously you guys have been with me for a long time. I'm not always just trading re like these crazy long-term reversals, right? This is, this is very, you know, I, I don't, I don't do this very often, right? Most of the time we're trading with the general trend of things and, you know, we're, we're taking trades. So this is, this is very different than maybe what some of you guys may be used to. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my outlook on just kind of like the like Euro USD, which translates into everything correlates to the U S dollar. Okay. Um, but also, you know, you see with the U S dollar, you see it came down to like this trend line area where we've made a series of lower highs in the past or I'm sorry, higher lows in the past. And then we made a bullish engulfing candle right now. So obviously, you know, rookie or novice, uh, traders are going to just be looking and i mean i'm not, not, not maybe not even rookies or novices there may be some professional traders out there that are just buying euro usd you know maybe there's traders out there that are big range traders right so you know they're buying down in this area expecting euro usd to go back up to the top of this range which which again it very could happen right if that scenario with euro usd breaking down the the, the yearly lows and going down to 111 if that happens well, then obviously that's going to be the dollar index inversely breaking the yearly highs up here and then moving up higher towards the resistance trend line, whereas Euro USD is that support trend line. So, um, you know, it's, it's not, I, I, again, I, I just cannot stress enough. I know I've said it so many times, but I just want you guys to know that this is just my opinion. Okay. I don't necessarily, um, I'm not necessarily perfect with everything. Okay. So where do we stand as far as trade opportunities? Well, like I said, I think if you, if you guys are really into working with those lower time frames, which I highly recommend, like don't necessarily make a habit over it. Don't, don't, I, I don't recommend making a living or a strategy off of scalping on the lower time frames because you know, to face it at the end of the day, guys, like maybe some of you guys want to, but me personally, 
my ideal lifestyle is not staring at the charts for 20 hours a day, you know, basically being forced, constraining myself to do that because I want to scalp, right? I would rather have the time freedom and be able to have many other things, not just Forex, multiple investments and different forms of investments and different markets and all different things working for me and not having to spend a ton of time, right? That's the ideal end goal for everybody, right? Every human being wants the freedom to do what they want in this life, right? That's what life is all about. And, you know, sure, you can make a living off of it and you can really make really, really good money. And you might even be able to make, you know, uh, you know, it's obviously subjective, but you know, there's some scalpers that make uh, more money than swing traders, you know, just because they're, exp just because, you know, they're, they're, spending that amount of time in the markets. But, um, I, I can't stress enough that it's not always that way. You know, there's people that will take, you know, a dozen to two dozen trades per year, and they're more profitable than somebody that took 2000 trades in a year. All right. It's never, I want you guys to write this quote down more trades does not equal more profits. Okay. So common misconception in this industry. All right. And so trade opportunities, I think for you scalpers, that's kind of what I was, was that's, um, that's what I was first saying is you may be able to find some very limited downside, right? 20, 30, 40 pips to the downside max. All right. In my, with, with this idea that I have, okay. With this, with this setup that I have, that is where I will be looking to enter a buy because at that point, if I'm able to buy let me, let me just kind of give you guys an example very quickly. Obviously, this is a hypothetical situation, so it's you know don't get don't get hyped or emotional off of something that isn't real, okay? But this is just just to kind of paint a picture for you guys. If I'm able to enter a little bit lower on Euro USD, all right, and that will allow me to put my stop loss below a level that makes sense, all right? Because kind of just like putting your stop loss that's not below a, above or below a significant level of support or resistance. It's kind of, in a sense, it's just kind of like taking a shot in the dark and hoping you don't get stopped out. Um, other times there's obviously it's kind of a case by case scenario, but you know, anyways, back to my point, if I'm able to enter lower, I can increase my risk to reward by a lot. So let's say we were enter a trade, you know, 86, you know, you could even round it up to like a hundred pips. Let's say it was like a hundred pips stop loss. Then if we are having some high targets, let's say we even like target 115 first, you can see our risk to reward ratio is a lot better than, um, you know, the required or the, the, the bare minimum I like to see, which is a 1.0 or a 2.0 risk to reward. I probably wouldn't have my stop loss this far below. I'd probably tighten it up a little. I guess it really doesn't make a huge difference, but that's, that's what I'm thinking. All right. That's, that, that's my ideal sort of situation on Euro USD. Um, and this could give us the opportunity to compound as well, a long-term trade like this. Cause I know I said, uh, I don't know if it was yesterday or the day before I said a trade like this can yield, you know, 15, 20, 30%, depending on how you play it. Obviously, you know, if you were to do something like a 2% risk on this with a, you know, let's say just like a 3.5 risk to reward, that's only going to make you 7%. But that's just on that entry. You know, let's say you find another entry above 113. You know, once we break above this major uh, level that we've had, you know, maybe you find another uh, good risk to reward trade to the same level, you know, but it has a good risk to reward because it's based on the lower time frames, like the daily or the four hour, you know, most likely probably the daily, and you're able to get maybe like the same risk to reward, maybe a 3.5 risk to reward on that trade. So now, hypothetically, if both of those trades hit your take profit, you're going to make 7% on the first entry, you make 7% on the second entry, boom, you just banked 17% with 2% risk, right? And the reason why I say 2% risk and not 4% risk, because you have two trades open, um, I guess I can kind of explain this because we're only about 30 minutes into the, today's webinar. Um, let me just kind of zoom in and I'll kind of like break down what I mean, how you can compound a trade without increasing the risk, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be awesome if you can compound a trade and add more positions to a trade without ever risking more money. I'm going to show you guys how right now. All right. So again, this is gonna be hypothetical, but I mean, you could literally like use this on like, tr like any real scenario that we've, we've traded. Um, but so, okay, let's say you 
take this, let's say this was a hypothetical happening on your USD, okay? This is what happened. Let's, let's say it happens and it goes up, all right? And let's say, you know, we take our buy down here, whatever price gets up, we get up to 113, we consolidate a little, whatever it breaks, okay? So you're in, you're in all these profits right here, all right? You have your stop loss still in this area, okay? If that's how, you know, hypothetically we've, we've managed this trade. Well, if you want, let's say you want to compound this trade. Let's say you see some sort of bullish confirmation and you believe that your USD is going to continue going up above 113 and you want to um, capitalize on that, right? You, you know it's going to go up, so you want to, again, you just want to capitalize on that. So let's say you take a buy up here. And you guys might be thinking, well, I have 2% risk on my original buy. And then let's say, hypothetically, use 2% risk on the second buy. Now, you, might, you guys might be thinking, well, now I have 4% of my account at risk, so it's no different than entering just two, you know, two trades or whatever. Not true if you do this, okay? If you take the first trade, let's just call this one down here. If you take trade, I mean, all, you guys know what it is, number one. If you take the first trade and you set the stop loss, you move the stop loss to break even, okay? Now, you, the first trade, is technically what we call risk free meaning that even if the markets were to drop and go back to where we entered we lose no money so trade one now as long as the trade is at break even zero percent risk okay and now if you enter let me let me erase everything if you enter a buy up here okay let me just use the buy marker let's say you place a buy up here at this time, you know, when price moves up, let's say, let me draw, draw that again. So you, you know, price moves down, we enter, whatever price moves up. Okay, here we are. And then we enter a buy there. Well, you can put your stop loss at the same area, or I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter necessarily where you put your stop loss for the second trade. I mean, obviously, it should make sense, all relative to price action. But the point that I'm trying to make is that you know, again, we don't care where the stop loss is at. We care about the percentage at risk, right? It doesn't matter if our stop loss is 40 pips or if it's 115 pips. We're still going to use our position size calculator to determine, you know, the lot size to use for the percentage that we want. So let's take, you know, let's say there's a trade like this and you put your stop loss down here because, you know, it, this is now, now we're working on maybe the daily time frame or the four hour rather than the weekly outlook that we had before. So you can, you know, afford to use a smaller stop loss. Well, you know, just, just kind of make sense of everything. Use some common sense with all this, guys. You know, we've got the first trade with 0% risk. Now you have a new trade with 2% risk. So just look at the facts, you know, look at, take a step back and look what, what happened. You have two positions in the market now, but you still have only the same 2% risk. Okay, it's not 4% risk. Okay, because that means let's say, you know, let's say whatever, you know, the market shit hits the fan and where you buy at, the markets go down from here. Well, again, you just get stopped out on this trade, lose 2%. You break even on this trade, you gain 0%. Okay? So you have actually only lost 2%, but you had the potential. Do you see how you're increasing your upside potential with this? Because look at this hypothetical scenario here. Your risk to reward ratio is basically a five. Okay? Like, let's just, for all intensive purposes, let's just round this up to five. Okay? So if you enter with the same 2% risk, okay, you're going to make 10% and then you would, would have made that 7% on this first trade if it hits our take profit. So now you made 17%. You know, and there's so many ways, and this is why like you guys have to come up with your own strategy and there's so many ways to decide how to manage this also because to, to even like make this sweeter looking, what if when you entered this trade, let's say, you know, we had this major level of consolidation that we were, you know, that we had that happened at 113 and we break. So you want your stop loss down here. Well, what if you put your stop loss from the first trade at the stop loss of the second trade, meaning that you're moving this stop loss into profit so that even if price drops down against you in your first trade gets stopped out with 2% risk you're still securing the profit on the first trade. So you actually are, you know, at that point, you're risking less than 2%, you know, maybe 1% or less, or maybe, you know, around there, whatever. You're just risking less than 2%. And your potential for the upside is now, you know, whatever your 
you know, you're, you're risking 2%, 1% or whatever, you know, whether that's, you know, 17% upside or 12% upside, whatever, you know, you have more upside. So hopefully that just kind of, I, I didn't want to get like, I guess, too into it, but I just wanted to share that with you guys of how um, I go about compounding positions. All right. And I don't, you, I mean, you guys will see, like, I don't compound like many positions. All right. It's not, this isn't like an all the time sort of thing, but when the setup permits, this is an opportunity. That's an opportunity to compound. Okay. And that is how you compound a trade, but don't risk more money. Okay. Obviously for that to happen, you have to be in profit with the first trade. That's the only way that you can enter more positions, but keep the risk the same. It's beautiful if you really think about it. You know, if you really think about the logistics of compounding a trade properly like that and just being methodical about where you put your stop losses, you're in, in where, how you're able to eliminate risk. Um, it's very, very, very nice. Okay. Um, and pretty much, guys, that's really all I've got. Oil, I'm not interested in trading right now. Um, well, uh, I know, I think what yesterday, Simon, if you're on here, you were asking if I thought it could go down to like, I don't know, you said 50 something. I mean, it's there, right? It happened. I said it, I said most likely it would happen. Like that was where price is going. So, you know, that happened. I think you said like 5150 or 5250, something like that yesterday or 50, yeah, something like that. But I mean, it's, it's there. It's there now. Um, or it, well, it went there. <laughs> it went down to 50, 58. So oil keeps dropping. Um, the rest of the markets are uh, kind of disgusting right now. Um, USD Swiss franc, obviously, you know, I'll be looking for like some sort of something like this kind of happening. Something when, when I look at this trade, this reminds me of Euro yen. Okay. And guys, this is how immersed you need to be in the market. If you want to truly be successful, like the fact that I'm not trying to like brag or anything like that, but just the fact that I can like picture these setups in my head and be like, and just have such familiar familiarity with the pairs and the, the 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 charts that it's like when I see a setup I'm like oh that looks kind of similar to a setup that's happened before look at this guys look what happened on euro yen oh does that doesn't that is that weird doesn't it kind of look exactly I mean very similar to what euro what USD Swiss franc is doing right this uptrend and then we break and then we consolidate for a while and then drop lower look at look at USD Swiss franc so interesting, right? Uptrend, boom, it's going to break. Hmm. Isn't that interesting, right? How the market tends to follow these high probability setups. Isn't that weird? I, I, I'm saying that kind of like condescending, right? Because like it's guys, it's, it's the market. It's like you have to understand this. In, in this. I'm trying to explain to you guys that it's simple. If you just take the time and the effort and just dedicate your freaking time to learning this stuff, it's not hard, okay? It's seriously not hard. It's just, you just have to show up. That's it. And that goes for any business. You want to be successful in anything in life, show up, put in the work, put in the time and the effort, treat it like a business and you will get results, period. It's it, like, guys, you have to understand that it is literally impossible to put serious time and committed energy and focused time into something and not get results. Okay. And I will call anybody out that tries to say that that's not true. Okay. Luck does not happen. Okay. F luck. Okay. Luck is created. Okay. Luck is the result of hard work. Okay. That's it. You want to call people lucky. People want to message me and talk to me all day and say, Oh, I wish I had your life. I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. Guys. Oh, you're so lucky. This and that guys, I'm not freaking lucky. I've actually had a very difficult life. All right. I've, I've not had the normal life that a lot of people have had. I've, it's the simple fact that I found the determination and the willpower to just stay focused for an extended period of time. That is it. All right. That is literally it. All right. So out of the mindset, back into the, back into the setup, I just noticed just, you know, obviously looking at this, it looks very similar to, um, the Euro. I mean, all of these yen setups, like guys, you should all be familiar with all these yen setups. Like look at uh, US uh, dollar. Oh, I guess dollar yen isn't the best. I remember Euro yen and Aussie dollar yen are probably 
like the best two, right? When Euro yen broke this area, it was kind of like something like this with AUD yen, right? We consolidated and going lower. And those of you guys that have been with me, do you guys remember when a couple months ago, back earlier this year, when we first broke this area, I'm sure you guys were doubting me. Right, or I'm sure there were people that, that had their doubts. We were looking for shorts. Obviously, this played out to be a longer setup. I was a little bit impatient and I didn't get into this, but I told you guys this would happen. I said, wait for some sort of retest of this area. I said it might turn into a complex uh, setup in this area, but Euro Yen will go down. Guys, you have to understand that the markets have to follow a pattern. The markets always follow a structural pattern. It does not matter what's going on really in the world. It's, I mean, and I know I don't want to sound like hypocritical when, because I talk about how important fundamentals are, but if you guys have never heard of the GAN theory before, you guys should go in and li listen to the GAN or look, look up and in, in, uh, in, in invest some time into learning about the GAN methodology. It basically states that fundamentals are out the window. Fundamentals don't matter whatsoever and the markets are always going to have this technical wave that happens and you're always just going to happen to coincidentally, the news is going to coincidentally coincide with what the market needs to do. And that's, I mean, I believe that. That is what I believe. We can actually even just like GAN theory. Um, boom, boom, boom. We can just very quickly pull up something. Let's see, GAN theory trading archives. GAN theory GAN angles is one of the most powerful methods used by traders to predict price and pattern change in the stock market. This is formulated by an American trader and market theorist, William Delbert Gann in 1935, and is still being used by traders and analysts to predict the behavior of the market. Um, I don't know if we can find anything else. Um, he determined these by analyzing charts using mathematical theories like Fibonacci. I mean, yeah, I mean, guys, all, all I can say is GAN did not care about fundamentals, okay? Zero care about fundamentals, one of the, like a world-renowned trader, okay? He did not care about fundamentals because he believed that his theory is that the market moves based on mathematics. And I believe that, guys, okay? That is the way, and everybody can have their opinions and beliefs, but this simple tool, this one tool right here, this, if you guys do not understand Fibonacci, simply using base, just simple, simple understanding of price action and, and chart patterns and understanding supply and demand and Fibonacci and the mathematics inside the market will make you an extreme amount of wealth. And I know I've talked about this before, but just to kind of like blow some of your guys' minds, Fibonacci is life. Literally, Fibonacci, you write this down in your journal, Fibonacci equals life, okay? It is what every single design and shape in this world is based off of, okay? And just to kind of, I, I know I've done this before, but I want to Fibonacci in, in life. At all of these patterns, guys, that you see in life, the inside of flowers, the inside of cactuses, the, uh, the way a snail's shell is, the way the human ear from like the hole in the side of our head, look, you see this person right here, their ear, the way the ear is shaped on our bodies, okay? If you guys haven't heard of, the, it's, it's also like another thing, uh, kind of is a branch of, of, of Fibonacci called sacred geometry. Um, like look at like this, like look at tornadoes, okay, or look at hurricanes, look at uh, the, the stars in the sky, the galaxies, every single, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to like, hopefully, uh, what, what's that, what's that, what's, does anybody know that, that technical term when you're making people feel small, like they feel like life is so insignificant, I forget the, forget the exact word for it, I don't mean to make you guys feel like that right now, or like blow your mind, but this is like, guys, this is, this is life. Okay. And it is also in the, so it's found everywhere in life. It's also found in the markets. Okay. That's why the markets will just always do what they need to do regardless of, of what the, the news, what, what is happening in the world. Mona Lisa guys. Okay. Picasso that painted the Mona Lisa he used Fibonacci to determine how he was going to set up and paint the Mona Lisa. Like, guys, uh, like uh, Plato, Socrates, some of the, 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 most, the, the most philosophical people of our entire life understood this stuff.
okay? You guys, and I'm not saying you have to be an expert, guys. Like, I'm not an expert, right? I couldn't give like a freaking hour, you know, I, I couldn't give like a, a TED talk, a presentation just on Fibonacci, right? I, I'm, I understand it. I understand the sequence. I understand how you got, like, I, I, and guys, I'm not going to like get into every single thing right now, but if you ever are curious, why is it 23.6? Why is it 38.2? Why is it 61.8? Why do I have that most people don't have 70.7? .7. All of these are found through the Fibonacci sequence. And if you guys are not familiar with the Fibonacci sequence, you start with zero, you add one, and then you take the previous number and you add it to itself and you continue to do that. So if you take zero and you add one to it, boom, you have one. And if you take one plus zero, which is the previous number, you have one. So now you have in this sequence, you have zero, one, one, all right, and then you take the, the last number and you add the previous number to it. So zero, one, one, so the last two numbers are one and one. What's one plus one? Two, right? So zero, one, one, two, and then you take, you just keep repeating itself. Two plus one is three. Three plus two is five. Five plus three is eight. Eight plus five is 13. So zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13 it goes on so on and so forth and i'm just gonna like share a little piece of tidbit for you let's go ahead and like let me open up my calculator very quickly uh give me just a second guys um let's go screen share Let's go to, well, actually first, let's go to a tab. And just so you guys can visually see it, because I'm, I'm sure some of you guys are, are smart with this stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not calling <laughs> some of you guys not smart. I'm just saying some of you guys probably are already familiar with the Fibonacci sequence. But if you aren't Fibonacci sequence. All right. So let's just take like this right here. All right. And let's take, let's just pick like a random, let's just take right here, 21 and 34. All right. If you go, okay, I mean, I'll just do it right here. If you take the numbers on your, on your calculator, let me open up my calculator. First, share it. So remember, last number in the sequence that we just saw was 2134, okay? Because 21 plus 13, the previous number in the sequence is 34. Look at 21 divided by 34. Oh, Hmm, that's interesting. 61.8. Whoa, crazy, right? So guys, this is, oh, hold on. Uh, I closed it out. Let me just go back here. So guys, this is how the market works is through a, a series of mathematics and a series of waves, all right? And it all goes down to math. That's it, okay? Um, you guys want to know something too? You want to know like the reason why um, the markets work? All right. It's because of this guy. Um, I always forget his name, but let's say uh, uh, he was a Buddhist, but guy who created, oops, I guess I'm not typing, a Forex candlestick origin maybe. Um, I mean, and, and uh, you guys ever hear Japanese candlesticks? It came from this guy, literally a rice counter, okay? He figured out how to trade Forex and how to use candlesticks from using pieces of rice, okay? It's literally, it's great. Like, you guys probably don't even know some of this stuff. It's crazy. Forex candlesticks creator, maybe. Munahisa Homa. Oh, where is he right here? I just saw his name right here. 18th century rice merchant from Saka to Japan who traded in the Dojima rice market in Osaka. Uh, he is sometimes considered to be the father of the candlestick chart. Look, you look at a, a, a picture of him. I, I don't even have, obviously they didn't have cameras back in the day, but there's like drawings and stuff. This guy, some of you guys may have seen him before. Like maybe pictures like floating around on social media. This guy invented candlesticks. Okay, so let me just kind of like break that limiting belief in Forex really quickly that if you guys don't think you can trade, but a rice trader from the 1600s figured out the Forex market, 
that is simply a limiting belief. You don't think you can do it. It's, be, it's because of a limiting belief. Okay. That's it guys. All right. Um, Kamara, you're asking about USD CAD. We'll go over that very quickly. Um, USD CAD is a little tricky. I kind of, you'll notice I, I kind of removed a lot of the stuff. This trade for me personally, Kamari, if you remember from last week when I was originally looking for maybe USD CAD breaking out of this range we were in, um, obviously on Friday, or was, was that Thursday, Friday? Let me check. I think it was Friday, right? Oh, it was, yeah, it was Friday. Friday's candle created this exhaustion candle. And similarly, just to kind of like add some value, remember earlier in today's webinar, guys, when I said that bearish and bullish engulfing candles work a lot better or a lot more respective to price action at their extremes when you're at, in at extreme high or an extreme low. Same thing with exhaustion candles, okay? We have an exhaustion candle here, and I validate exhaustion candles, again, based on where they are in perspective to the overall price action. And when I look at USD CAD, I see that we are at an extreme. We're at the yearly highs, all right? So that, for me, invalidated the longs on USD CAD, and then now we're seeing downside. And then obviously, as things have unfolded over the past couple of days, we've seen the US dollar find some weakness. So I guess everything that I'm insinuating, Kamari, is I would probably expect USD CAD to do one of two things, all right? I don't think USD CAD will go up much, but I think it'll either stay, continue to stay in this range and consolidate, or with the US continued US dollar weakness, it, may, it, it will continue lower. I'm more leaning, if you want my honest uh, bias or what my, you know, my brain's thinking right now, I think it's gonna see some more downside. Maybe a temporary consolidation, maybe the next day or two, or I guess that would be the rest of the week. And then as the, the upcoming weeks unfold, I think USD CAD will break lower, okay? Um, and you know what, actually out of all the charts, honestly, I'm glad you, you asked about USD CAD because USD CAD is something that is kind of like on the, the, hind, uh, the, the back burner for me at the moment because price action isn't terrible with this pair. Um, what is terrible is the consolidation. I don't like really trading such, such, such a small range. I don't mind trading if there's a range that's created over like a year or two, like let's go back to USD CAD back when it was ranging, um, back in here, right? I don't mind trading this range back in like 2016 when we were trading this range. Those of you guys that were with positive traders back in this area, because if you measure the size of this range, we're looking at like a 600 pip range, you know, so that can, uh, you can achieve, you know, really good risk to rewards, even if you don't pick the top or the bottom inside that range. Whereas if you just look at this range on USD CAD, which is right here, that's a fraction of 600 pips, right? Literally like 20% of that. We're like 130 pip, even if you want to be conservative and say 150 pips, it's hard to get a good risk to reward ratio on any type of trade unless you're picking the top or the bottom with that, okay? So that's, that's my opinion on range trading and why I won't do it in this, in this scenario. Yeah, no problem, Kamar. Um, does anybody ha else have any uh, like pairs that they want me to look at or any analysis you want me to do? Oh, GBP CAD is interesting. It's just consolidating at these lows. That's interesting. See what the pound's doing. Pound yen, pound dollar. Still, pound is still I mean, not not falling over the past couple of days, but it's consolidating at the lows. Not a lot of so basically, like I see the pound is not really a driver in the market right now. Um, GBP CAD, you know, if USD CAD goes lower, that Canadian dollar strength should pull this pull this lower. But I I don't know. I'm not not too keen on that right now. Uh, gold, sure, we can look at gold. Oh yeah, I, I'll, I'll look at gold. It's uh, let me just plug my computer in real quick. You know, I love MacBooks, but the one thing about them is, I don't know. It's probably me because I have like fifty different things open, but my computer, my battery is just so terrible. Yeah, battery sucks on them. Yeah, absolutely. I even like train the battery. I don't like keep my computer plugged in all the time like a lot of people do. I think it's really bad for it. But yeah, uh, Simon, gold. Okay, let's look at gold. So gold, once again, continued to find strength. Um, yesterday, uh, over the past 24 hours, it went up from like the highs where we were at the time. 
like 1327 up to 1344. If any of you guys caught that, this is, this is pretty, this is actually a pretty nice little intraday setup right? You see the consolidation at these highs, really tight consolidation. You have to, you have to be very respect of each, of each pair, right? If I saw this kind of consolidation on like AUD USD or something like that, I wouldn't be so stoked, but keep in mind, gold is a very volatile pair. So when I see an extended time of period of consolidation like that with such a lack of, you know, no retracement after such a big move, um, you can usually expect short-term following that to find some upside. So if you guys were able to make some money, catch some pips on uh, gold, it, you know, it technically went up almost 200 pips last night on gold, came back down right at the area. But uh, I mean, uh, my, my bias on gold is, is still bullish. Okay. I'm uh, just like I'm bullish on Euro USD and I'm bearish on the U S dollar. Um, I think gold is, is, is going to continue flying. And you know, it's so funny guys, literally, wasn't I just saying last, I mean, I was, I was reiterating what I said earlier this year. Okay. So that's even more impressive in my opinion that literally earlier this year, I said that gold would go and we're, we're talking about when gold was down in this area. I said gold would have no problem breaking the multi-year highs. Look at it in two weeks. It has the biggest gain it's seen in the past couple of months. That's pretty intense, right? We're breaking highs. We're breaking above March highs. So multi, multi, multi month highs, multi, multi, multi week highs. We're breaking right now. So look how fast gold can move. I think I think it'll continue going. Obviously, with waves of volatility, you know, going down for a period of time, then going up. But overall, as we go week by week by week, uh, I think we're gonna continue to see gold uh, trend higher. And that doesn't mean we can't have a bearish week for gold. But I'm talking about, you know, when I, when I say gold is gonna go higher, I'm talking like in the next, you know, it as we get toward to the end of the year, between now and the end of the year, gold is going to have no problem going higher and higher. Okay. So that's what I think on gold, but it looks like that's it guys. That's all we got in the chat. I mean, actually you guys were very active tonight, asking all sorts of questions, putting all, all sorts of input. I'm, I'm glad we were able to um, do this tonight. I hope you guys got some value out of me talking about compounding a trade and, and, you know, going over the things like Fibonacci and that type of stuff. And, I hope you guys are just getting some value from this stuff. I, I really, really enjoy doing these daily webinars with you guys. So um, other than that, and, and as always, I appreciate you guys, you know, taking time out of your, out of your life to, you know, dedicate it to your, your growth, You're dedicating it to your learning and growth and being consistent with these and, and just, just simply showing up no other way to put it, just simply showing up is what's going to separate you guys from the non-successful traders out there or the people that go in circles or the barely, barely, you know, break even traders. Okay. But that's it for the night guys, uh, or evening or afternoon or, after, or morning, wherever you are. Uh, other than that, I will see you guys on tomorrow's final webinar for the week and, uh, yeah, see you guys tomorrow. Take care, everybody.